Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this. I feel, as, a, as an early medievalist, a bit of an interloper. In me, you don't have <coughs> an expert on the Scottish salt industry. On the other hand, you do have the descendant of an 18th century Scottish salter, um, which is how I <coughs> came interested in this. There he is. The Port Soy Salt Works was small, <coughs> unimportant, and probably short-lived. But it's worth investigating as illustrating something that's been neglected a bit in the study of this subject, very small, perhaps informal salt works, which slipped under the radar of the excise officers and are therefore not recorded in the salt vouchers. And this nice um, drone view of Port Soy Harbour, there, here is the old harbour, and the site we're interested in is just there with the channel coming out to sea, and we'll see more pictures of that <coughs> in a moment. And here on the Roy map, there it is, on this very sharply indented coast. Port Soy was a small fishing and trading community. It expanded rapidly in the later 18th century when it was dominated by a mercantile and commercial elite with wide-ranging interests, whose clear leader in the 1780s was Alexander Robertson, the current head of James Robertson and Company we've just heard about, now moving on to the next generation, and <clears throat> a member of a widespread merchant clan with kinsmen based in Rotterdam and Dunkirk. In Port Soy at home, um, Robertson's affairs with local girls and the huge number of bastard children he produced were, were notorious, and there's a good deal of evidence of, 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 of intensive gossip, and indeed these sources give a rather nice picture of a community that was very informal and very well integrated, not least in its sharing of gossip, as well as looking out to the wider maritime world. <clears throat> this atmosphere may have been heightened by a common dislike of government taxes. Smuggling was by its nature a covert activity, but we've got a vivid account in a seemingly reliable memoir written half a century later, which says, every merchant in the town and of various places in the neighbourhood became engaged in smuggling. The articles imported in this manner were all kinds of foreign wines and spirits, tea, tobacco, crystal, chinaware, and various kinds of soft goods. The Messrs. Robertson were very deeply engaged in smuggling. Um, this can be completely substantiated. In June 1782, the excise took advantage of the Robertsons' insolvency to seize a huge quantity of illegal claret, port, and sherry. 34 hogsheads of claret, and so it goes on. This is a panicky letter written by one of the firm to the Duke of Gordon's agent saying, please, please come and help us get these excise men out of the way. So there's no question that this was going on. And in 1786, it was reported that no duties for wine were paid in Port Soy or any of the neighbouring creeks, except when vessels were forcibly carried in by ships employed in the revenue service. This context is relevant to the salt works because if the excise authorities couldn't prevent the smuggling of wine in such large quantities, it seems unlikely that they kept a very effective grip on small-scale salt production. <coughs> the eventual salt works on the northwest corner of the harbour is first recorded as a salmon boiling house. There is a building on the site, or I think it is the building, on the Roy map. It's shown clearly on Ordnance Survey maps. Uh, this uh, enlargement of the first OS map uh, is, has superimposed on it the um, dimensions of the plot stated in a conveyance of 1780, uh, where it's described as um, a tenement at the northwest corner of the harbour at Port Soy on which the houses erected for boiling salmon presently stand. The dimensions correspond exactly, so I think there's no doubt at all, as we'll see, that that is the site. During 1780 to 82, where we have a little window of archival evidence, uh, the tenants of the salmon house were Alexander Robertson and company. And at this point, the Duke of Gordon's salmon fishery on the Spey was using the Port Soy boiling house. Um, the Spey fisheries output and its markets in London and the Low Countries did not prosper. They seem to have been spectacularly incompetent. Some of the salmon was off, um, uh, and they're increasingly irate 
uh, correspondence with the managers of the boiling house. All this came to a head in February 1782 when Alexander Robertson and his company went bankrupt. Alexander was hauled off to Banff jail, uh, the excise raided the wine. The company survived in the longer term, but the immediate shock to the local economy must have been considerable, and the Robertson's management of the Salmon House apparently ended at this point, 1782, though the fine data estate rent books continue to call it a salmon boiling house, and that goes on, as we'll see. The formal term boiling house covers a potential range of processes, from straightforward boiling in brine to the, the more uh, sophisticated and newer technique of kitting, um, pickling in a mixture of, of um, uh, vinegar and, and um, brine in small uh, um, wooden tubs. And this uh, inventory of the contents of the house, which is dated May 1781, uh, makes it clear that kitting was being employed at that point. It refers to tubs for salt, tubs for vinegar, uh, 36 empty kits. What it does not mention is anything suggesting that salt was being made there. So it seems that um, at, at that point uh, they obviously needed salt, they were not making it there. From 1782 the story goes dead except for the recurrent year-by-year -year references in the rent books of the Findlater estate. During 1801-3 the Salmon House was redeveloped as a business officially defined as a salt house. In 1843 a local resident recalled the manufacture of salt was formally carried out to a small extent, the works for which were situated on the west side of the harbour. But after a long trial, interesting comment that, it turned out so unprofitable as to be abandoned more than 30 years ago, in other words, by, by about 1813. And we can trace this change in the documents. In 1801, the Salmon House was sold to a group of local people, and then again in 1802, in shares of one quarter to three quarters, and it's now described as a tenement at the northwest corner of the harbour of Port Soy, on which a salt work is now erected. And a note of 1807 in the Find Later archive describes the tenants as a salting company. It's the only reference to that. The rebuilding in 1802 was followed by not very successful attempts to market for the three quarters shares in the enterprise. Uh, so there are newspaper adverts from November 1803 onwards. That one says that these shares last year yielded a profit of upwards of 78 pounds and the work may be greatly extended. In February 1806, the shares were offered for sale in similarly upbeat terms. Three fourth shares of the salt works with all the utensils belonging thereto. The pan has undergone a thorough repair lately and the houses are all in good order. There is always a very great demand for salt, which is well known to be good. That was over-optimistic. In 1808, the shares were again offered for sale or felling that on lease, the ever hopeful vendors still insisting that the houses and pan are in good order and well adapted for the manufacturing of salt. But alas, that didn't work and it looks as though production probably did stop around 1812 or 1813, and then sadly here in 1829, an advert for the piece of ground at the northwest corner of the harbour, which was some times ago occupied as a salt works. So that's the end of the story. Um, presumably the small business failed because it couldn't compete with better, cheaper, or more abundant supplies of salt from elsewhere. And it seems relevant that whereas in 1793 the general view of the agriculture of Banff laments that the huge herring catches were being wasted because of the scarcity and extravagant price of salt, the 1812 edition observes cheerfully that the fishers now have all the salt necessary for curing the fish taken on the coast duty free. So far then the story seems straightforward. We might think the building was used as a salmon boiling works until about 1802, was then developed as a salt works, which struggled on rather unsuccessfully for another decade. But there's a problem. 
The salt vouchers, which Chris Watley looked at long ago, show that duty was paid for production of salt in Port Soy from 1793. There's no other plausible site in quite a well-documented case, and I think we have to conclude that at least during those nine years from 1793 to 1802, salt was being made in the building that was officially a salmon house. We're in a position to say that because the duty was paid from 1793 onwards, but how confident can we be that there'd be no earlier salt production which eluded the excise authorities? One avenue to exploring the earlier and undocumented aspects of the salt operation is through the career of the man who almost certainly ran it. In 1798, members of the Bampshire Volunteers in Port Soy, who contributed to the Defence Fund against the French, included Alexander Blair Salter. There he is. Um, and out of more than 60 minor artisans whose occupations are given in this list, he's the only Salter, so presumably he must have run this outfit. <coughs> Alexander was not a native of Bampshire, and there's strong circumstantial evidence that he was born in 1769 to a long-standing Collier family in Clackmannanshire who had married into at least one Salter family. His grandfather James had made medical history in 1732 by being the first ever beneficiary of successful mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in the world after a mining accident. Alexander must have been familiar with the salt-making industry from his earliest years. Equally, he must have been only too aware of its steep decline on the Upper Fourth by the 1780s. We know that Alexander was in Port Soy by November 1784 because he was a witness to a case in the Kirk Session. Believe it or not, it's a fornication case. What else could it be in a Kirk Session uh, record? Uh, so he's there by late 1784. He married in Port Soy in 1788 and again in 1791 and had children there from 1791 onwards. He's called Salter, we've seen, in 1798. But interestingly, at the, at the baptism of a child in 1814, he's simply called Labourer. Perhaps the later part of Alexander's career tracked the failing trajectory of the salt works. As prospects declined, it seems significant that Alexander's eldest and perhaps only surviving son didn't follow his son, his father, into the salt-making industry, but became a soldier. If it was between that point and 1813 that salt production ceased in Port Soy, the family had to seek other options. <coughs> but of course, for present purposes, more important is the start of his career in Port Soy. If he was a salter, and we know how specialised that was, why was he there from 1784 onwards, if not to make salt? And his presence strongly suggests that the production of salt in the Salmon House had in fact started nearly a decade before 1793. And I think the story probably is that after the debacle in 1782, uh, the, the tenants of the Salmon House got fed up with the, um, uh, uh, what seems to be a lost cause of producing decent salmon there. And maybe in 1784 they decided to switch to um, uh, to, to salt, and presumably using their contacts on the Upper Fourth, where they'd have got coal from, imported this teenager to um, s start making salt for them. And if that's right, then one assumes that any excise officer who'd poked his head through the door of the salmon boiling house would actually have seen a salt pan. Um, but maybe that's not so surprising, um, given what we know about the incompetence of the excise in uh, the area. And if, if that is the case, and there was a phase when the operation was covert and illegal, it was a minor illegality compared with other things that were happening regularly in Port Soy. Now, finally, a quick rundown on the, um, the archaeology of the site. Here it is on an estate map of 1802. This plan may or may not be representational, shows the range is much narrower than, than later. Maybe what we're seeing here is the footprint just before the um, 1802 rebuilding. So now we're looking across the harbour in, in a northwesterly direction. There is uh, Lord Findlater's storehouse, and the site of the uh, salt works is just here. 
That is the blocked arch into the bucket pot we'll see in a moment. And the foundations of the buildings can still be seen here on this grassy slope poking through the turf. This is the uh, saltwater inlet channel, um, rather damaged, but quite unmistakably, at least at this point, um, is um, artificial. Here we're looking out to sea. <coughs> so there's the channel coming in from here. In the foreground, the area, this, 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 this flat, low-lying area, which must be the bucket pot. We saw Chris's children earlier. Here you see the youngest descendants of Alexander Blair forming the scale. Now looking the other way, along the channel, towards, the, here's the, the bucket pot area. There must have been, as we've seen already, there must have been some mechanism for raising the water up. And here is this interesting blocking, um, the, the, in some ways the best visible archaeology for this. This is clearly blocking in a lined channel, which must be a culvert uh, leading the salt water from the bucket pot um, through to the pan house. This, so far as I can see, this photograph is the one and only uh, photo we've got of the building still standing. There is the storehouse, but there behind that mast of sails is the pair of buildings, the larger building there, you can see a doorway and a window, and then the smaller building there. And there are some other photographs from the first half of the 20th century as it gets increasingly ruinous. So there's my attempt at a sketch plan. I, I did my best. I only had a day, and I, and I didn't have um, very sophisticated surveying equipment. But uh, that, those are the two buildings, I think we can say reliably, uh, from the OS plan and the bits that you can see. That must be where the cistern is. The bucket pot, the channel. And then there, there is a deep, obviously artificial square feature cut in the rock. What is that? Is it for some sort of winding gear? Could it be... Um, uh, for a tank to keep live salmon during the salmon house phase. Um, this obviously needs a proper um, survey, and perhaps one could commend it for archaeology, since here we have a site that's extremely uh, precisely documented. We know when it was in use, and so far as one can see, it is more or less undisturbed. So, although the Port Soy Salt Works was insignificant on a national scale, it does perhaps offer some methodological lessons. One might have thought that the existence or non-existence of a late 18th century Scottish salt works would be a matter of obvious public knowledge and clear record, but instead the story of this one has had to be teased out of fragmentary and intractable sources, and some aspects still depend on circumstantial inferences. How many more operations of this kind may there have been around the northern Scottish coasts? If this case study were to prove typical rather than exceptional, the aggregate contribution to output might not be quite so insignificant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>